Good morning. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk um, about business practices, setting up a business, uh, promotion, really big, a um, lot about people training, and then games. And you'll see why we're going to talk about games in the afternoon when we talk about them. It's one of the best ways to train people that I know. Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, got into the field of pet dog training because you like dogs. Um, talking to you know, a lot of people at my seminars, some people say, well, I don't really like humans, or I don't get on well with humans, so I became a dog trainer. And I, I think, well, are you in the wrong field? Th that is the field of pet dog training. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a working dog trainer or training a dog for competition when you're doing all the work with the dog yourself, but that's not what we're doing here. What we have to do is basically to teach other people our job. So our job is teaching people how to train their dog. Well, we also have to teach them, usually it's mum that comes to class, we have to teach her how to train the rest of the family to train the dog that she's just trained. Um, how to set rules. Um, it's not funny to tease the dog. It's not funny to bully the dog. Um, and how to motivate other members of the family. And the difficult ones, of course, being people like father-in-laws, you know, spouses, especially white chromosome carrying spouses. Um, and, and to teach them that, no, that this, this is not a joke. Yes, we want to have lots of fun doing this, but you've got to stick to the rules and to motivate them to want to do it. If we look at a, a lot of today's talk, which is, it is promotion, it's spreading the word. It's all about people training. It's about taking all the things that you've learnt about reinforcement schedules and actually applying them to your interactions with people. And I'm mentioning this up front because this is where I think so many dog trainers um, are just woefully incomplete. You know, they will say, and they probably are, um, totally, totally, totally positive trainers. They're really wonderful. It's like reward only. Classes are just, a, it's a party place to be. You know, everyone comes out smiling and the dog's tails are wagging. Um, but then these people can be very nasty to other people, especially other dog trainers. And I personally know of no other profession like this. Um, you know, I'm a veterinarian, I'm a psychologist, and I'll go to veterinary conferences, I'll go to psychological conferences, and I listen to the discourse um, in a seminar or at the bar afterwards, and two people are just violently disagreeing. And they're talking it through with smiles on their faces. There's no personal acrimony. Um, dog training is, is different. Now, the good news is it's um, not as bad here as it is in England. If you want to see dog trainers disagree, you should go to a seminar in England. There's so many different groups, and they have incredible difficulty even talking to each other, let alone coming together as a big profession. So as I look at dog training or pet dog training from the benefit of looking back now some 40 years, and seeing the field actually uh, be whelped and then grow up under my very own eyes, um, we, we have to stick together to become a profession. We, we can't be infighting. It's, it's all too silly. Um, the, the reasons for starting the APDT, um, there were several. The, the primary reason will probably surprise you. Um, it was in the 80s I was lecturing all over the States and um, in every city I went, I would find one or two people that were teaching puppy classes. And, you know, because they'd heard about my classes and the word had spread, but only one or two people. Nearly everything else was on leash, wait until the dog's six months to a year old, on leash, don't, don't give him any clues what you want him to do and then keep jerking him lots. You know, it hadn't really thought out the, the training process. So I would travel, and I traveled a lot, doing as much then as I do now, about 180 nights a year in hotels, and I would meet these wonderful people who thought they were all alone. So I thought, what a neat idea to get them together. 
And so we arranged that big conference in Orlando in 1994, and we had 307 dog trainers, and they came together, and they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe there were so many other people like them. And there was a lot of togetherness then. Um, we're getting a lot of fighting now. The other reason for starting the APDT was, I think that dog trainers should determine their own destiny. And by that, I mean, if there are rules to be made about the training of dogs, I personally think those rules should be made by dog trainers and not by veterinarians or psychologists or governments. And this, of course, is what is happening now all around the world in different countries. In some countries in Europe, the government is telling you whether you can train dogs or not. Who is qualified to do it? Um, in other countries, it's the veterinarians that make the decisions and say, oh no, you, you should not be treating behavior problems. That, that, that's practicing, you know, veterinary medicine without a license. And this came up quite recently, about two years ago, and the APDT just wrote a very nice letter saying, I'm sorry, but you aren't qualified to say that. You are not dog trainers. And, and I think we have to get it quite clear. If you want nutrition advice, you should go to someone who knows about nutrition. If you want veterinary advice, you should go to your veterinarian. If you want breeding advice, go to the breeder. If you want training advice, come to a trainer. So the world of pet dog training is very, very different from um, the, the way training used to be. It was all based on training dogs for competition or to do a job. So it was obedience competition, or it was schutzend, or it was um, tracking. Um, and now, of course, we have so many more um, exciting competitions to do. But the person was a specialist, the dog was a specialist, and they would stay in class forever. You couldn't get rid of them. They'd come to class, and they'd still be there three years later trying to get the third leg in open or something like that. Very different from pet dog training where the person is just a normal person, just anyone. They could be a plumber or a psychiatrist. The dog is any dog and every dog. It could be a Basenji Basset cross. It could be an Italian Greyhound. We have to train them all. We don't have specialist pet dogs. Um, I personally think we should. I think we should actually breed up a few breeds and these would be specialty pet dogs. You know, they are not like possessed of the devil, like, you know, Beaucerons and Malinois, that you can't even get up to go to the bathroom to take a leak without them healing all the way there and looking at you when you're doing it. Um, I think it would be nice just to train a dog that, no, we've bred this dog to be a companion. You can talk to him. He might even talk back. I love you, in what they do. The other big difference is the syllabus. The syllabus back then was tiny. Think about it. How many of you competed in obedience? Um, well, you, before you got your dog, you had all the questions in the exam, right? Of course. You knew exactly what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to do your sit stay and your down stay and your healing off leash. And as you move up, your discriminated retrieves and discriminated jumping and out of sight stays. It, it, it's kind of like if I, when I went to vet college, they said, well, here's your final exam, Ian. In anatomy, it's going to be the dog stifle. I think, brilliant. All I've got to do is learn the dog stifle, and I can pass this exam and be a veterinarian. But what kind of veterinarian would I be? Well, pretty good on dog stifles, but not good with cows and pigs and cats or chickens. Not great uh, with elbows. You know, you see what I mean? So the exam then was very tiny. It was finite. And all of the training was geared towards the exam. Can you get your dog to do an off-leash recall? In comes pet dog training in 1982. And all of a sudden, we have a different syllabus, right? Number one, the people aren't experts. Number two, the dogs aren't specialist dogs. And number three, the syllabus is all over the place, comprising every single aspect of behavior, temperament and training problems. Things that you couldn't even think, you think up to put in the syllabus. Things that happen in real life that we have to prepare the dog for. Really quite amazing. 
I mean, when I look at some of my bite cases, for, for seven years I did a bite clinic in the late um, 70s, early 80s. And some of the cases I wouldn't have dreamt that I'd have to train the dog for this. At a cocktail party, someone comes in, trips, goes flying, and headbutts the dog who's chewing a bone. She gets bitten in the face. Um, a lady is running out, she's got a date, and she's all dressed up to the nines, and um, the telephone rings, so this is before mobile phone, so she runs back to answer it, thinking it's the guy she's going to meet, and she treads on her Rottweiler's thigh with her stiletto heels, and it penetrates all the way through. She gets bitten in the ankle. A little boy with a Superman cape on jumps off a coffee table and lands on a Malamute. Oof, I heard it from the kitchen. The little boy is in this room at the moment. Um, he didn't get bitten. The dog got up and came to me. Uh, terrible irresponsibility there. What was he doing in the living room with the dog unattended? Um, that really taught me something. All those cases I mentioned, by the way, um, no one got hurt. The dog had bite inhibition. Yes, they got bitten. They got teeth on the skin, but there was no skin puncture. Um, another case, this is a dog coming back from a hospice, having visited um, children who are dying, and the handler shut the door on the dog's tail, and the dog mutilated her. This is a golden retriever. Went up and down her arm and just shredded it. I just wouldn't have thought, you know, that I'd have to put these in the syllabus. And that's why we make puppy classes the way they are. They should be a pantomime, an extravaganza, a party, music, totally off leash, all over the place. You're flooding the puppy with everything. So when these weird start things happen in life, the puppy says, did that week three. Yeah, <laughs> when they had all the children roll across the floor and squeak. Oh yeah, no problem. You see what I mean? We have this great advantage of puppy class, but we're not actually taking it. We've forgotten what it, it should be, but we'll talk about that on, on, uh, on Monday. So, let's start off. Let's say you are a beginning dog trainer, or you think you want to train a dog, um, or you've been doing it for a while. What is the best thing that you can do? Um, I still think the best thing for you to do is to go to the APDT conference. Um, not necessarily every year, but occasionally. Like this year, it was pretty close. It was in San Diego, good city, sunshine, lovely. Um, personally, if I were in charge still, they would either be in Orlando or San Diego, two out of three years. Anyway, the APDT conference is its just the best bang for the buck out there. There's nothing like it. You know, registration's about $500, and you're going to get the chance to listen to 35-plus speakers. Um, it, it still is one of the best things to do. Better than the speakers, though. And probably I shouldn't say this, um, uh, but I'm a speaker myself, so I guess I can. Better than the speakers is the networking that you'll do there. Just like the, the um, Orlando 1994, the getting together of these people and finding people like you at your level in training, whether you haven't taught your first class yet, whether you, haven't, uh, you don't have a company yet, you don't even have a business card, or whether you have a corporation with uh, 25 employees. So wherever you are in training, there are other people like you out there. And that's who you hook up with, um, and that's where you really learn. Going over the seminars together later on at dinner or in the bar. So it's the best thing to do by far. Um, at the moment, I think the CPDT is probably the best certification you can get. Um, it is the only one that's international. Um, they now conduct it in Japanese, um, in a number of countries around the world. Um, it's a pretty good test. And if you want letters after your name, and I, I think it's, it's good in an emerging profession, then CPDT are, I think, good letters to have. What else? Well, we have books, we have DVDs, um, online academies. Um, there's so much now. There's so much now. When I started in the field of dog behavior, um, which incidentally, for those of you will probably see my tie later, 
um, and realize uh, the fact that I was involved or studying dogs was, was quite by chance. I actually tossed a coin between cows and dogs. I was in Africa and I realized when I came back from Africa, um, <coughs> I had a veterinary research job out there, I was going to have to work as a vet and it frightened me. It really frightened me, the concept of working nine to five and being stuck in the same town. That is not me. I like to be on the go, moving around all the time, and I can't do nine to five. I knew that then, and I had a little panic. So I thought, what will I do? Academics, you see, you know? And what topic? Well, I liked obstetrics, and I had discovered behavior in 1966, the study of domestic animals, and I found it fascinating. And that's how all this stuff started. It didn't start with dogs. There was no one studying dog behavior. It was the study of cows to produce more milk, pigs to stop them fighting, chickens to grow quicker so you can kill them earlier, and sheep so you could get them to ovulate all in the same week. So then you could let the ram loose so they're all going to lamb in the same week. So it was all about production, animals. So I just studied behavior. I liked obstetrics. I put it together, sexual behavior. And I thought, what animal? Well, I always liked dogs. I grew up with dogs. Uh, I was a farm boy. Um, when I was a kid, I'd be roaming the fields with three dogs following me. A Springer Spaniel, a Black Labrador, and a Jack Russell Terrier. But I loved cows. It was a difficult decision. I thought, well, it's probably going to be different because we have pet dogs. We don't really have pet cows. If I went with cows, it would largely be production. I knew that. It would be beef and it would be milk. But with dogs, there was the whole notion that it would just be, you know, just regular people and regular dogs, as well as doing the sporting dogs and working dogs. So anyway, I tossed a coin, came down dogs. And then I researched, where can I study sexual behavior of dogs um, near San Francisco? Uh, why? Well, I'd just been through London in the 60s. There was only one place in the world better than that, and it was San Francisco. <laughs> Well, I got two replies, one from Davis, two sentences that basically said, sorry, and then one from Berkeley. Two and a half pages of single spaced typed letter saying we'd love you to come and join our program. It, back then, it had been going for 15 years um, at Yale. They'd moved to Berkeley, and I joined a 30-year uh, program on the study of dog behavior. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I can't believe my days in Berkeley. Getting up in the morning, wandering along to see the dogs, having a beer, watching the mate, finishing at about 11.30, going home. I thought, this is amazing. This is a job. Yeah, and it's a job with a million dollar grant too. People threw money at us back then. And quite by chance, because of a veterinarian I knew who worked in Berkeley, one of the clients of this veterinarian came in and said, do you know anyone who can teach a 10-week course on dog behavior? And they said, yes, we do, actually. There's a young English veterinarian who's doing a PhD course at Berkeley. So in, in 1972, I taught a 10-week long um, program for the university extension and loved it. I was uh, lecturing at the university at the time and the most common question you're asked by a student at university is, will this be on the midterm? <laughs> really provoking, insightful questions. When I lectured to pet owners, to dog owners, they were so interested. And I got hooked by doing what I still love to do today. If I were to put a list on my fridge of the top 10 things that Ian likes to do, this would be way up the top there, along with skiing, tango, uh, gardening, walking the dog, stuff like that. I, I love lecturing to people who are interested. Back then, there was basically uh, just one book, Scott and Fuller, um, Social Behavior and Genetics of the Dog. Was that the title? Social Behavior? Ages. Someone stole my copy. I had a copy that was signed by John, uh, Paul Scott and John Fuller and Frank Beach, who was my mentor. It was given to him. I lent it to a puppy trainer and never saw it again. And I questioned it, but of course, what did you learn from that? You don't lend books, you give them away. Yeah. 
I always say goodbye to books that I lend. I say, it's been nice having you around. Bye-bye. Okay, I'll lend them to you for a while, but I don't expect to see this book back. We then had Michael Fox's stuff, but that was it. That, that was it. Now we have everything out there. You go to Dogwise, you go to Torza, you have a choice of probably a thousand days of seminar to buy, to listen to, um, hundreds of books which are really good, really good. It took forever for there to be a good book, book on pet dog training. Uh, now we have loads of them. DVDs, and now we have online. We have wonderful websites like Dogstar Daily. Isn't that cool or what? Is there anyone here who doesn't know, who hasn't been to Dogstar Daily? How many people here have been to Dogstar Daily? That's in have you been to Dogstar Daily? No? Ah, uh, then your hand should have gone up the first question, you see? <laughs> We're doing. You should definitely go to Dogstar Daily. It's a brilliant site. Um, it's my son, um, Kelly, my wife, and myself. Just the three of us do it. And we're going to have radical changes next year and make it even better. So, this brings us to a big question of education that, strangely enough, Jamie and I were chatting about in the car and, and actually in the Irish pub last night. Um, so many people think that education is data delivery. And it's not. You know, delivering data is not the way to do it. Um, we emailed you notes, and the notes for the puppy classes and the adult dog classes are enormous. That's data. I really hope you don't expect me to stand here and read it to you. You see what I mean, the difference? We are here to go over what's important in those notes. What you have are absolutely representative notes of our syllabus for teaching a puppy class. The education part, that's data delivery. Boom, boom. We push a button, and theoretically, you should have all got it. Okay, we, I just left a message for them to email you the notes again. So just so you know, the last two days are identical to what you have. It's uh, today and tomorrow are uh, my notes. They're notes for me. They're not actually notes for you, but I thought, if I'm going to use them, you may as well have them to see that we, do, we are following a route today. I'm not all over the place, okay? This is very different from my normal lectures, where I just lecture without notes and I don't know what I'm going to say until I say it. Here we have to, to go through this bit by bit. So data delivery is done by sites like Dogstar Daily. You know, if you want the data, then deliver it online now. I think you know where I'm going with this. This is how you should deliver data to um, your clients. If you're talking in class, what an absolute criminal waste of time. You know, if you have to say anything in class, then your data delivery system is flawed. If anyone asks you a question in class, then you've done a rotten job at delivering the data. Agreed? Anytime someone asks you a question, you should write it down. I remember I had a trainer years ago. Um, he used to be the editor for the very first APDT newsletter when it came out. Um, he's from San Jose. And in the San Jose Serious Puppy Training location, he had round the wall a computer printout. And it was this paper, you know, with the holes in either sides. Do you remember that? And it went all the way around the room, and they were numbers. One, two, three, up to 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. And if someone would ask him a question in puppy class, he would say, question number 19. And they would go to the big number that said 19 and read the answer. Or if someone would say something, well, my dog does it at home, he'd say 42. And it says, well, it's convenient that your dog does it at home because you live with your dog at home. So that's really cool. But you know what? I think he just didn't do it in class right now. And what worries me, if he didn't do it in class, maybe there are other situations when he wouldn't do it, like if someone left your front door open and the dog's running into the street. That's why we practice in many different places. So you, you don't want to keep delivering information. You're not a parrot. I, I, I tell vets this. The first, you know, puppy consult. And they spend, oh, could be as short as 15 minutes, as long as 45 minutes with the new puppy, a new puppy owner. And I tell them, what are you really doing here? All you want to check is this animal's alive, you know, and healthy. You're going to look in his eyes, look in his ears. 
you know, take his temperature, you know, you're going to auscultate, and let's be honest, we have some vets here, right? Veterinarians, here one, that's all? No. Two, that's good, welcome, thank you very much for coming. And, and the, the whole point of auscultation with a little puppy, I mean, we can see he's healthy. We're checking a few signs which would take, what, four minutes, five minutes? But we put on the stethoscope, shall we tell them why we do it? It's the only way to get the owner to shut up. <laughs> It's nine in the morning and you can put your stethoscope on and say, let me just auscultate and see if he has any heart murmurs. And thank goodness, oh man. Mm. Oh, Starbucks, I need my Starbucks, good <laughs> Lord. Okay, yes. And yeah, probably the puppy does have a little murmur, lots of them do. But the health check is actually quite cursory. Um, what this should be is a progressive desensitization, classical conditioning routine for 30 minutes. You hand feed this puppy so much liver that when he gets in the car to drive home, he throws up. <laughs> but he says, man, what a place. I've never been to a place like that. Everyone is so friendly and they gave me so much liver. I love that. And you handle the puppy everywhere. And you ring a little bell, ding, 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 puppy on premises. So everyone who's not doing something comes up and says, hello, puppy. Yes, I'm Dr. Dunbar, and here's a liver treat. Um, the delivery of data, are you talking to this person? Well, they aren't listening. There's a puppy in the room. I'm sorry, they will not be listening to anything you're saying. And even if they did, they're only going to retain less than 10% of it anyway. I think they say it's 7% of spoken material is retained. If you think it's important, put it on a disc and give it to the owner. So I've been saying this for years to veterinarians, they aren't doing it yet, so it's what we're doing right after this uh, academy. I'm putting it on the disc for veterinarians, and I'm personally going to deliver about 100 of them to 100 vet clinics. And say, here's your disc, all you have to do is duplicate this, and you can either email it to your clients, and it will be two books, before you get your puppy, after you get your puppy, uh, 16 behavior blueprints, and lots of other fun stuff too links to a whole page of links to videos they can watch online. How to house train your puppy, how to chew toy train your puppy, how to teach your puppy to come, to follow, and what have you. I mean, it's what vets should be doing. Why? You see every single puppy when it's eight weeks old. There's just two of you that have that privilege. Everyone else sitting in the room here would be think, wow, my business would be different if every person came to me with their eight-week-old puppy. We'd all be millionaires, right? be wonderful and we could do something with the dogs but instead they come to us too late so we rely on veterinarians to get puppies at the appropriate time so data delivery then whether it's you learning is different from education education is we'll probably do some of that here that I, I like to make myself open to people when I'm, I'm traveling at seminars um, in the bar after I've eaten in the evenings, that is education. That's when we say, well, I like what you said about such and such, but um, di da di da di da. You've got the data. I do not want to be in the bar delivering data about dogs. That will ruin my beer, you understand? But questions about the data, yeah, that's what education is about. Whether you are trying to educate yourself, it's easy now. Just, you know, ask your spouse for a thousand dollar subscription to Tours a Dog Video or Direct Books and uh, Dogwise. And there you've got data. You know, all these seminars are now, you know, digitized. But the education comes from discussing it. Same thing with your owners. Um, Jamie and I were chatting in the car that they got it back to front. Children should not be doing lessons at school. They should be chatting to the teacher about the data they received from their computer when they were at home. All lessons should be online. You know, and I, I think about the way I was taught at school. It was mindless. This one teacher, lovely teacher, great teacher, taught me physics, delivered exactly the same lecture to me as he gave to my brother seven years before and to my uncle 35 years before, exactly the same dialogue. It's written down, it's scripted with the jokes. Why on earth didn't he just copy it 
and give it to us, and then we could have done experiments or chatted about it. You understand? Good. So, seminars are cool. The whole thing about now the choice is you will eventually find someone you like listening to for the education aspect. The data you get from the books, the DVDs, and from online. But eventually you'll go to a lecturer, it could be a Donna Duford, um, Patricia McConnell, um, Jennifer Messer, you know, these are you know, people who I love listening to and talking to about dogs. Um, and then you will go to their seminar. And the point is not to take notes, but to sit back and see how their mind processes the data. And if you get the chance to actually chat to them. So that's education. You may get an apprenticeship with this person, if you're lucky. Um, we don't offer formal apprenticeships, but we're usually open to anyone who comes by. We just had a guy from England. Um, he was kind of pilloried in the media. This was a young guy who had the gumption to get, uh, he knows about TV production. And so he got a program on TV, um, and a lot of dog trainers didn't like what he was doing. I mean, I looked at it, looked fine to me. Um, he could have done it a lot quicker. He did get bitten a few times, which, you know, wasn't cool because now the dog is, is biting and that's what we're trying to prevent. Um, so anyway, the, an editor in a major dog magazine said, if you, if you want dog training information, why don't you come to me? So he did. This 22-year-old kid says, all right, I, I want dog training information. So then she thought, oh dear, what can we do? So she emailed me, can you help this guy out? And I said, sure, you know, tell him he's got to go to the APDT conference. If he does, I'll chat to him. In the end, Kelly invited him to stay at the house. They drove down together, talking dogs all the way. I introduced him to other trainers I knew. So every evening he was with good trainers talking. Then he came to stay with us afterwards. And then the two of us flew together to Philadelphia for a three-day seminar. He got one hell of an education for free, right by my side all the time. If ever he had a question, it was answered whatever we were doing, whether we were drinking a beer or we were walking around uh, Philadelphia. So that's what you're looking for. You know, who is the person that you want to apprentice under? And it needn't be a certain apprenticeship where you are with them and you're following them around. They could be in a different country. This could be a trainer in England, you know, who you really like. Maybe Sarah Whitehead or Gwen Bailey. But you start, start up an informal apprenticeship. Can I Skype you? once a month and you have a two-hour you know conversation and chatting then hands-on um, if you're new go and volunteer at a shelter and just work with a whole bunch of dogs get a couple of hundred dogs under your belt in the next two months um, it's just it's the quickest education that I know different dogs different dogs if you go to most academies um, I checked them all out about three years ago and um, the cheapest ones I were looking at were about $5,000. They went up to $20,000, dog training academies. Um, the largest number of dogs that you worked with at any of these academies was three. It was ridiculous, especially when a couple of the academies were taught at humane societies. You should have been working with 20 dogs every day. You know, hands-on. The whole thing is hands-on, hands-on, hands-on. You've got to develop that hands-on experience. And simple questions like you're standing in front of a cage and you ask the question, do I want to go in that cage with that dog, yes or no? That is a very penetrating question to ask and it will teach you lots about dogs. So next, business. Um, and this applies whether it's just you doing a bit of training on the side, doing a bit of dog walking, nothing's formal, or you've actually incorporated. The process is quite simple. Um, if you want uh, business information or any kind of legal information too, NOLO Press is where you want to go, N-O-L-O. -O. Um, they're actually situated in Berkeley, but you can buy their books from any large bookstore. And NOLO Press will help you whether you want to uh, incorporate. Uh, the last business I incorporated was Open Poor. Um, did it for my wife. We had a lawyer doing it and he was faffing around. I thought, to hell with this. I went to NOLO Press. I got the book, How to Incorporate a Nonprofit, and did it all myself. It's so simple. 
So it takes you through these legal business practices. So we start out, the first thing we want to do is to really benefit from our hobby. For lots of us it starts as a hobby and then we start to charge for it. As soon as you charge for it, you need to get your taxes right. And so the easiest way to do it and where you can still fill out your own tax returns. I don't know how many of you, how many of you still fill out your own forms? That's cool, yeah. So if you're just using a 1040, all you need to add in is a Schedule C, and that will be your business. Um, if you're charging money, my advice would be, now, when I'm giving business advice here, this is purely advice, uh, let's put it this way, this is what Ian did. I can't advise you about um, taxes and what have you. You must eventually you know, seek the legal advice or what have you. The easy route is the route I took. That as soon as I started charging for dogs, I started a separate bank account to separate the funds. Okay? If you don't do that, you'll be running everything through your personal tax return. It'll all be lumped out. So the first step is your Schedule C. Any business-related expense now is entered in the Schedule C. And you can now claim many, many deductions. Um, the number one thing, of course, you can claim is your dog, which includes dog food and veterinary bills. If you are a dog trainer, you need a dog, agreed? You have no street cred if you don't have a dog. What sort of dog do you have? Well, actually, I have Persian cats. <laughs> Next. So it's kind of like a plumber has tools. A carpenter has tools. A systems programmer has a computer. We are dog trainers. We have to have a dog. Everything related to this dog now is a very kosher tax deduction from my viewpoint. And I've been audited three times now, and this has gone without question. Without, they say, what? And I call it canine husbandry. And it comes from buying the dog, dog food, veterinary expenses, crates and toys and everything. Everything that's purchased for the dogs. Um, what does get questioned is travel and entertainment expenses, of which, of course, I have a lot because I'm spending 180 nights a year in hotels. So when I explain that to them, and say, look, this is how I earn my money. See, this is what I learned in Japan. What I earned in Japan. This is what I earned in Canada. This is what I earned in England. Oh, I see. So you travel to work. That's what I do. Yes, um, it's not in my city. If I give a seminar in Berkeley, well, I'm, we're doing one in January. If we get six people there, we'll be lucky. Why? I'm not an expert in Berkeley. You have to come from at least a hundred miles away to be an expert. Well, I only travelled ninety to get here, so I'm barely an expert in Sacramento. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> so, Schedule C is cool. So now you can add in a uh, telephone. <coughs> and um, these days it's all changed. We have a mobile phone. Um, there's n no reason why um, the majority of that can be a business expense. You can, if you like, get a business phone. And I would strongly advise this. Um, once you've been in training for a year. Otherwise, the phone will drive you crazy and destroy your marriage and your life. You cannot be taking these calls from the general public on your personal phone. So that's the very first one of the quantum leaps, get a business phone. And then the whole thing is tax deductible. Um, and, of course, that's where most of your data download expense will be because you're online checking out stuff about dogs and downloading, you know, um, things for your education. If you have an office in the home, that can be a tax deduction. And that means a certain percentage of your mortgage, your rent, um, your utilities can now be a tax deduction. And it's usually done by number of rooms or square footage. Um, this is something, if you are audited, they will check on. So make sure it's an office in the home. 
Okay, it's not just a table that you use to have dinner on as well, and you just happen to have a computer there. So an area which is taped off, and I tell people if you're using half of a room, then put masking tape on the floor. That's your office. And it's very good for tax reasons to have it uh, delineated that way. And it's very good for your brain. One of the dangers of being a dog trainer, the majority of you are working for yourselves. And that's a great way to destroy your life. It really is. You've got to separate work from play. Um, it always amazes me how Jamie does that. He has this beautiful delineation because he works for me. And, uh, you know, he's on the clock or he's off the clock. He's two different people. It's so obvious. And I remember once I, I rang him up and asked him to do something and he said, it is Saturday, you know, Dad. And he didn't say no, he was just letting me know it was Saturday. I said, oh yeah, he can wait till Monday. On the other hand, if I sent him a specially coded message, um, yeah, he probably would do something for me on a Saturday. Like once I, we had a screw up with notes and I said, can you get a notes emailed out? Um, and he knows it's really important just the way it's written. We'll talk a lot about that as, as we go on, how to code information to dogs so they know whether, you, whether it's really important or not. Because most of what we ask dogs to do, we don't really care if they do it or not. And most of the time they don't do it anyway. <laughs> but then occasionally we get mad when they don't and the dog can't work it out. Once you solve that conundrum, you've suddenly got absolute compliance on demand. When you want compliance, you can get it. So, if you now get someone to work for you, are they going to be an independent contractor or an employee? Uh, my advice is move towards employee as quickly as possible. Become kosher. Um, do it right. The whole independent contractor thing is, is kind of um, woolly. You've got to look at the rules very, very carefully. You do not want to screw up with that. If you classify someone as an independent contractor and you pay them money without deductions and stuff, and you get audited and you're wrong, you owe an awful lot of stuff. A lot of back taxes. So when you start to get that second trainer, that, that, that employee, I would make them an employee. That would be my advice there. My advice is I would move through this route very quickly from Schedule C to incorporate. It's very easy, it's not expensive, it has lots of advantages and you're looking ahead with the right frame of mind that you want to be a business person. All right? Now that, not be what all, that may not be what all of you are looking for, but if you do want to be a successful dog training business, then become a successful dog training business. And I would say incorporate and have employees. If on the other hand you say, no, 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 Ian, I just want to do it myself. I don't think I ever want to have employees. That's cool then I would stick to a Schedule C. Very, very easy to do. The thing about a corporation, it is a, a different legal entity. So it's starting to separate you from danger. There's two ways we do this. One is incorporating, the other is insurance. You've got to have insurance. You've got to have insurance. You understand that? What did Ian say? You've got to have insurance. It's not that expensive. Um, I think APDT does it with insurance carriers of the Carolinas. Um, you've got to have insurance. We live in America, the land of the Sioux. Um, people can sue you for anything, for anything. And usually it is anything. It so seldom is anything that you've done wrong. A single lawsuit, and you know that, what is the danger of a lawsuit? How do you get stung? The legal fees, I mean, they could go up to $100,000 in three months. Legal fees, defending yourself. You have to have insurance. And you explain to them if you get sued, you must not settle on this. Because usually they want to settle if it's less than 35000 you know, 40000 50000 So many lawsuits will be suing, say, 20 different people for 30000 each. Well, every single insurance company is going to settle then they will cancel your insurance and put your rates up. So if you ever get sued, you write to the insurance company immediately and say, um, deal with this, you must not settle. It's a fatuous lawsuit. You know, if you settle, you may have a lawsuit. 
and you've got to get them to go after the people. But they should be doing that. You can't afford to. The legal fees will just eat everything you own. So it's not that you're going to lose the lawsuit, because the insurance will take care of that. That's why you have it. It's what legal fees are you paying, okay? And this is something to think about when you have employees. You know, if you have employees, then I would very strongly suggest you, you go and learn about human resources and all the rules and regulations and the things that you must not say, must not do, and on and on and on. Um, you've got to have an umbrella insurance for those sort of claims as well. Um, and it can be anything. This trainer was promoted over me and I'm English. So you don't like English people. You've got a lawsuit now. And so you need insurance. You need insurance. It's a very, very good investment. If you do have employees, um, learn about human resources. And I would get a payroll service with the bank. I did my own payroll for years. Stupid. Um, I used to add it up by hand, all the deductions, add them up this way, that way, and the big column at the end had to be the same. And, oh, it was a nightmare. Now I just call in the figures and everyone gets a direct deposit into their account. So, safety, as well as insurance, financial safety. Um, think what you're doing, you're dealing with the general public and you're dealing with dogs. So we have two safety issues here. Um, one is people. If you're doing consults in the home, it's nowhere near as dangerous as it used to be that you're going into someone's home. Um, and you're a woman. I mean, look around at the, the, the sex of dog training. It has changed sex in the last 40 years. Absolutely changed sex, as did the veterinary profession. So you're going into someone's home. Very important, your office knows where you are. Very easy to do now with this. Um, any client you go to, you stand by the door, you take a photograph, you geotag it. It has a time stamp. Everyone knows exactly where you were at this time. You ring the doorbell and then you say, no, I'm right with Mr. Brown right now, just going in the house. Okay, I'll check back later. Boom. So just basic safety issues that um, your office or it could be your spouse uh, knows exactly where you are and this person knows that other people know where you are. So just, it's, it's just something to think about. Safety with dogs. Um, really only important with adult dogs and if we're dealing with uh, aggression. Um, and we'll make that quite clear about the difference between training adult dogs and training puppies. And, and the reason I'm doing the academy this way round is that when I talk about adult dog training, there's so many constraints. There's so many things you can't do. Because you've got 12 adult dogs here, you don't know if they have bite inhibition to people, let alone other dogs. So the classes are pretty damn boring, right? I mean, think about it. And I want you to feel that boredom <laughs> so you understand the joy or what you can do in teaching puppy classes. In a puppy class, you can do anything and everything. But at the moment, it's not being done. We just did a survey uh, about four years ago of puppy classes um, in an area of the country. And I had a Japanese student go around and she observed the classes and filmed them. And um, no one thought about anything because it was a Japanese dog trainer saying, could I watch your class and film it? What they didn't know was she was scoring what she saw for me. And one index she looked at is how many minutes is the owner sitting on a chair with the puppy on leash listening to the trainer talk? Between 50 and 75% of the time. Shocking, absolutely shocking. This is a puppy class. And what is the trainer doing? Data delivery because she has not done efficient data delivery by email or online, she is lecturing them and the puppies are there. It's criminal. What could we have done better? We could have just 
let the puppies off leash and let them play. Or everyone could pick up someone else's puppy and handle it, and we could pass it round the room. There's so much we could have done that, that's, that's better. So that's why I do it this way round. I want you to listen to the adult dog stuff and then hate it. And say, why can't we do puppy classes? Well, you can. Get on and do it. And now you know the importance of having them off leash the whole time. Dogs of all breeds. Integrating training into the play. Not having play sessions. You'll learn all the importance of it because of the constraints of adult dog training. Okay, what are the quantum leaps you'll make? Well, there's several of them. The first is when you realize, I want to be a dog trainer. And I remember when I had that quantum leap. Um, I was a house husband. That my wife, um, Mimi, Jamie's mum, um, had a really good job. So I didn't work. I would go and give the odd dog lecture and, you know, hang around the home. And then when Jamie was born, I became a house stay-at-home dad. I loved it. Anyway, my wife went out and worked and earned lots of money, and we had a really lovely car, a fancy Saab, you know. And um, one day we went to, um, oh boy, the place where the birds was filmed. What's? Bodega, Bodega Bay. And we're staying in this little cottage on the sea. And my wife said, Ian, here's a cigar. I want you to go and sit on that rock and not come in until you can tell me how you're going to earn some money. I thought, damn. <laughs> anyway, I went out to the rock and I sat there. And as I sat there, the tide came in. And I smoked my cigar and I thought about it. I thought, oh, yeah, I probably should earn some money. You know, what should I? I was about 30 then, I guess. You know, what should I do? And I thought, well, it's got to be to do with dogs. I mean, let's face it. I'm a veterinarian. I've just spent 10 years researching dog behavior. Um, I've got very interested in training. Um, yeah, it probably should be to do with dogs. And then I thought of criteria. Can't be nine to five. Has to be worthwhile. It has to make me feel good that I'm doing something that's worthwhile. It has to be reproducible. Right then my brain was going, whatever I start, I want other people to do for me. Um, and I just thought, I know what I'll do. I'll teach puppy classes. That was 1981 sitting on a rock in the Pacific Ocean, I had that thought, I'm going to teach puppy classes. So I jumped in the sink, it was wet now, and I walked back, and I'd only smoked about two inches of my cigar, and Mimi says, well, you're back early. I said, yeah, I'm going to be a puppy trainer. She said, you're going to do what? You know, with your two doctorate degrees? I said, I'm going to teach puppy classes. I'm going to get people to bring their puppies when they're, say, three months old, and we let them off leash, and we train them off leash. And she just shook her head. Uh, went back to Berkeley, so now it had moved, we're now into 1982, started the first puppy class January the 26th, that's nearly 30 years ago, and we had 12 puppies in the first class. I went to the local veterinarians, who I knew all of them because I would talk at their, you know, veterinary medical association meetings, usually once every six months, and I said, hey, I'm going to teach puppy classes, I need you to send me puppies. The business was an instant success. I think the first, something like 10 classes I taught were full up, 12 puppy maximum. And off and running, we were doing it. Um, and worthwhile? Oh, I think so. And what's the worthwhile aspect of it? Well, obviously, it's good for the puppies, um, but it's good for the people. You know, they are trying to change the behavior of a different individual and an individual of a different species. That really teaches you a lot of skills which are very useful when you're trying to change the behavior of different individuals of the same species, <laughs> like your children or your spouse. Well, maybe you could argue there <laughs> he's of a different species, couldn't you? But sorry. Um, <laughs> that's what it's all about, changing behavior, learning how to change behavior and not having an argument doing it. When Jamie and I were walking, we were selecting a place to eat last night. We went to Old Town, Sacramento, which, by the way, you just go under the tunnel. You're right there. For those of you who haven't been here, it's really cute. You should go there and eat in the evenings. It's fun. Um, I asked Jamie the question, and I said, um, have we ever had an argument? And we both thought for a while, and Jamie says, well, there was this incident. I said, no, that wasn't an argument, Jamie. That was you freaking out. 
you had a meltdown in a swimming pool in Phoenix. I remember that. But as soon as you told me why you were upset, we rectified it, right? And um, we thought really hard. And no, we've never had an argument. Well, does he do everything I want him to do? No. I mean, uh, would he, if I asked him nicely and politely and pleaded, I would hope yes. But does he see life the same as me? Absolutely not. But what's the point of having an argument? You know, did I educate him? I like to think I did when he was little. Now, of course, the roles have reversed somewhat. So with all the high-tech stuff, he's educating me. Do we have arguments over that? No. He will say things like, Dad, step back from the computer. <laughs> okay. And we get things done. So this is what the worthwhile aspect was. It's changing the way we change behavior.